today we'll talk about, all right, so we're going to talk about model predictive control, which is some of the more popular modern control techniques. Um, of course, this in itself is a huge topic. There is a whole course at UPenn dedicated to it. Um, so we won't be able to do justice to it in just one lecture, but we'll, you know, we'll try our best and mostly try to give you the high level idea of what model predictive control is and how is it useful in the context of the course that you're studying or for autonomous racing or autonomous driving. So yeah, my name is Yash Pant. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo. Um, and yeah, the slide deck was modified from that that Rahul shared with me earlier. And also we are using a lot of material by Professor Manfred Morari at the University of Pennsylvania. Of course, if you find this lecture interesting, then I'd recommend taking his course as well. Okay, so in terms of this lecture, we'll be talking about four things. We'll first give a high level introduction to MPC. Essentially, we'll restrict it to the context of what can it do for you. Then we'll get into an overview of what MPC is, how it works, and some of the basic math behind model predictive control, and also why it works. Um, we'll talk briefly about what a model predictive control implementation on your F110 platform or for autonomous racing would look like. And finally, um, based on how much time we have, we'll also talk about some of the basics of system dynamics or the first principle physics modeling of your race cars that is useful for using model predictive control. Because the first well, alphabet in MPC is M for model. All right, so now MPC has a lot of applications, not just in racing, um, but I guess we'll focus on applications in that particular domain. So we can use MPC for, for example, trajectory tracking. And here's an example of a hierarchical model predictive control algorithm. Um, I'll just play this video. Oops, sorry, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so you have this autonomous car with a trajectory that is in yellow. Um, that is the actual trajectory that <clears throat> your vehicle is going to follow. In green, you have a reference trajectory. Think of that as given by some higher level trajectory planner that tells you this is what the best, for example, the racing line would look like. And the red lines over here are safety constraints generated again online through some algorithm. We'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. And so the task of the car is to follow the green line, stay within the red lines, that is avoid obstacles. And then of course, compute your steering and throttle for the car such that it can do it. And this kind of a problem can be encoded to a model predictive control problem. As you can see over here, the car makes these drastic maneuvers to avoid these obstacles, makes it through. And you have these different red lines, which are candidate sets that you should stay within. And so you can use this for racing. I suppose this was being done around the, uh, Levine corridor, it seems like, so right outside of Rahul's lab. That's one application, so it can be used for trajectory tracking, for example. But over there, you need to know the model of the car, or you need to know the physics of the car. Now, the modern day MPC applications where you don't even need to know the model exactly, you can start off with some nominal trajectory, some simplified controller, like a PID controller, to just follow a trajectory. And then you can learn over time uh, what the model is and improve. So for example, this is, an application of learning MPC to racing done on the Berkeley Autonomous Race Car Platform. So we have a car starting off with a very simple uh, trajectory that's slowly going around the track. Uh, by the way, quick question, uh, is the sound being shared or is that something that's not happening right now? No, there's no sound from the video. Okay, I will share sound because in one of the videos later on, I will need sound. So let me know if you can hear this video. Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so the car starts off slowly, you know, it takes a few laps. So it started off at about 18 seconds. Now it's driving around, it's learning the track, that, that is the constraints on the car. It's also learning the dynamics of the car. And as the lap number goes up, you can see that lap time comes down. So it's online learning and then using that to control the car to speed it up. So yeah, this is another application of model predictive control for racing. Unfortunately, we won't be talking about learning MPC so much. We'll talk about the more classical versions of MPC where you do know a model and you design the constraints as well and you don't learn them. One thing that we will talk about towards the end of this lecture is model predictive contour contouring control or using model predictive control as both a local trajectory planner and a low level controller combined. Um, so in this case, we have these 143rd scale race cars called the Orca race car from ETH Zurich. So this is a track. Um, these are RC cars with a downward facing camera that gives you the position of these cars. Also their orientation and velocities. 
<clears throat> and you have one car that is going to be operating over here in a track with other static obstacles. You can see at these really high speeds, you're actually running model predictive contouring control on the inside to generate local trajectories that the car can follow very closely. And it's doing that while avoiding the obstacles, staying within the track and so on. In fact, it's so fast that if you look at this slowed down version, it almost seems like the car is bending. So yeah, we we'll talk about model predictive controlling, uh, contouring control at the end of the lecture. But again, this is one more thing that model predictive control can do for you. But if you've taken a controls class, like let's say a 406 or 504, the question would be, well, we spent so much time talking about PID or lead lag controllers. Why don't we just use that for control of the car? And so now we'll try to motivate what you know, MPC, of course, you saw it can do some cool things, but it can do things beyond what you could do with a simple PID. The first thing about PID control is that it's usually a single input, single output controller. That is, it takes in a single error signal that tells you how far you are from a desired reference and maps it to a single control variable or a single output. Uh, for example, taking your heading angle error and mapping it to the steering angle. So that would be um, something that a PID can do for you. Shown on top over here is the uh, control equation for a proportional integral derivative controller. If you have seen it, great. If not, I guess you don't have to worry about it too much in this class. But the kind of systems that you're mostly going to be concerned with, for example, these cars, are multi-input, multi-output systems. That is, you have multiple measurements coming from them. You have your angle, you have your velocities, you also have positions. And you have to control multiple signals. You're not just controlling, controlling steering, you're controlling both steering and throttle. And they have to be coordinated in the way they're going to act. So for these kind of things, PID kind of uh, is usually inadequate. For example, just like I said, a car has multiple control inputs, steering angle, throttle, for example. And if you have independent PID controllers that are controlling these uh, inputs without talking to each other, you could come up with infeasible or bad commands. For example, you might just flip the car over. Um, yeah, an example of that could be you're traveling at a high velocity and you give a really high steering angle. If the center of gravity of your car is high, then it's going to roll over. So you want to avoid these kind of things. And PID doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll be able to do that. MPC, on the other hand, will try to give you some strong guarantees on what it can do. Speaking of what else MPC can do is that it can explicitly deal with constraints on the system. As we just saw, it was avoiding these static obstacles or staying within the boundaries. MPC is, um, PID kind of struggles to do that. And it could also generate, again, impossible control inputs. For example, there is no reason why the equation shown over here for a large enough um, error signal and how far away you are from your desired racing line, it could generate a huge steering angle, like 90 degrees or even more, which is physically impossible for the car to do. So model predictive control, on the other hand, has a model, it has constraints, and it knows not to do these kind of things. So you know, with that, just to summarize, model predictive control will allow you to deal with multi-input, multi-output systems in a natural manner, similar to, um, you know, for example, that would be your race car, Versus in PID, you have to come up with a lot of hacks to make it work for multi-input, multi-output systems. MPC can also satisfy constraints. For example, you could have some limits on velocity. Like if you're in the pit lane, your car has physical acceleration bounds. There's obstacles that you want to avoid. And of course, you want to generate trajectories that your car can follow. MPC, as we'll see later on, will allow you to do all of that. Okay, um, any questions so far? I guess not, so let's continue. And right, just to take a look at a picture of what multi-input, multi-output uh, with a PID would look like, you would have to stack up multiple PID controllers, feed them independent error signals for different references, and then you send those control signals to your plant, where by the plant over here, we mean the dynamical system. So for example, think of that as your steering and throttle for the car. You get your outputs, and then you try to kind of make them independent in a way that your control PID controller works. MPC, on the other hand, can take in your multiple outputs or a vector of outputs and also generate a vector of inputs or these multi-inputs to control your car, for example. So again, this is something that uh, MPC handles in a very natural manner, whereas with PID, you have to hack it. In terms of autonomous driving or racing, MPC is important because you do have a lot of constraints. For example, in driving, you have an explicit speed constraint that you want to respect. Um, you have acceleration bounds. You also have steering limits on the car that you want to make sure uh, are respected. You also want to generate trajectories if you're using MPC as a low-level trajectory generator that can be followed by the car. 
So it can do that for you. And of course, not just generate dynamically feasible trajectories, but also trajectories that don't go outside of the track bounds or crash into other obstacles, uh, static obstacles. MPC can allow you to do all that, whereas PID would, you, know, again, you need a bunch of hacks to make that happen. So in addition to what uh, we just saw so far, MPC gives you these nice properties. It'll generate uh, trajectories, if you're using it as a trajectory generator, that are locally optimal. We'll see what that means, optimal with respect to some objective, and we'll see what those objectives are later on. It can naturally handle multi-input, multi-output systems. It can satisfy a bunch of different types of constraints. And as opposed to a PID, which is usually agnostic to what's happening inside your dynamical system, your MPC automatically leverages first principles physics models. And a lot of effort has been put in into coming up with good computational models for cars, for example. MPC allows you to leverage all that and use it in a way that your control signal is generated using these models to satisfy the constraints while being optimal. So again, in the context of this course, MPC can do these kind of things for you. Now, MPC is implemented on, as you'll see, you'll be implementing on computers for autonomous cars, but it's not just for computers. Humans also work in a way very similar to the way model predictive control works. And an example of that from the racing domain is the way Artin Senna, uh, used to drive, especially his throttle technique, which was uh, noticeably different from that of other drivers of his era. So I'm going to play a video and I'll ask you to pay close attention to the sound of the engine. All right, so first up we have, uh, I think it's a LaRue. So this is from 1992. So this is a LaRue powered by a Lamborghini engine. And listen to how the car goes through the curve and how it accelerates out of the curve. Similarly, we have a Minardi and a Ferrari coming in after that. And so what you would have noted over here is that uh, you see the throttle drop out a little bit as they enter the curve because they want to slow down. And then they gradually pick up in the throttle and accelerate out of the curve. So it's a very smooth sounding behavior from all these three drivers. Now we'll look at the McLaren of Art and Senna coming in and pay, again, pay close attention to what you hear. So that's one example. Let's see Senna drive by again. And once more. All right, uh, does anyone want to describe like what they just heard? Like what was the difference between the first three drivers and the way Art and Senna was driving around? Okay, you can come up here then. Uh, he was pressing the throttle trot uh, intermittently. Yeah, exactly. He was pulsing on the throttle, he was going on and off with the throttle. And, oh, sorry, let me get to the next slide. All right, and that's kind of shown in this particular um, figure over here. This is some data that, um, I'll, give, I'll give a reference to it, um, it's plotted by someone. So it's the throttle over here versus time. In black, you have a traditional throttle. On the left-hand side, of course, your x-axis is time, y-axis is throttle. Your leftmost point is your entry point into the curve. So you see that the traditional and um, both Senna, um, they drop the throttle. So you see the throttle go down. And then for the other drivers, they're gradually smoothing, uh, they're smoothly uh, increasing the throttle as they come out of the curve. Senna, on the other hand, as you heard, was going up and on and off with the throttle. So it has the spiky behavior that results in these pulses of sound. And the reason why Senna might have been doing this is, again, this is just one possible explanation. There's a couple of them. Um, one is to, that he was trying to compensate for turbocharger lag. So Senna started racing, um, I guess, in the 70s, back when a lot of these cars were powered by turbocharged engines. Turbochargers back in the day um, took some time to spool up. So if you went full throttle, you would have this noticeable um, fraction of a second lag before the engine would actually, spool, the turbo would spool up and you would get maximum acceleration from the car. What Artin Senna is doing over here is that he has a mental model of the turbocharger behavior. Because of that model and the spiky um, uh, throttling that he's doing, he's actually keeping the turbocharger spooled up because it depends on the rate of your throttle. 
And because he's keeping the turbochargers cooled up, he's predictively, you know, he's thinking ahead. He's thinking about what should I do at the end of the curve? So by the end of the curve, he's trying to maximize acceleration and come out of the curve faster than anyone else, which is kind of why Artin Senna was so good in the early 80s, driving mediocre cars, and he was competing with the top drivers. That's because he, one of the things was, in addition to his natural talent, that you know he could, he was very fast exiting the curves due to anticipating turbocharger lag. Now there are a couple of references over here. If you want to take more, um, if you want to take a deeper look into what's going on, I'll share the link uh, of the slides with Rahul, and he can share that with you later on. But again, what he's doing over here is he has a model, and he's predictively trying, trying to optimize something, which is exactly what model predictive control does as well. It uses a model and with some look ahead tries to optimize for some objective function. So with that, let's move on to what MPC is trying to do. So again, like I said, the MPC can be thought of as an optimization algorithm in your closed loop that is going to be computing your control input for you, as opposed to classical control like PID or a linear quadratic regulator, which is a fixed um, mathematical function, but takes in a reference, takes in the measurement, computes the error, gives you the input to the system, what MPC is going to do is it's going to take in the reference, take in the measurement, and it has a model of your plant or a model of your dynamical system, just like Arvind Senna is thinking about turbocharger lag. And now instead of planning, com computing a control input that is just optimal now, you're trying to compute an, um, an input that is going to be optimal over some time horizon. I think just like Arvind Senna, he's looking to the end of the curve. MPC will be looking at some moving time window to optimize over. So again, the MPC, as opposed to your classical controllers, is an optimization algorithm in the loop. The question is, what is that optimization algorithm then? And essentially, we're trying to solve a constrained optimization problem with a very general form of that shown over here. So you're trying to, um, given your current state of the system, oops. Okay, just going to try to see if I can do some annotations over here. All right, so this is the current state of the system, x of t. And you're trying to find a sequence of control signals, u of t, that minimize a given cost function. So this over here is your cost or your objective to be minimized. We'll take a look at some mathematical forms for this later on. You're doing this starting off with your measurement. So this is your starting point that you start off with the initial state. And you're using a system model. So the evolution of the state in time, so for k plus one time steps ahead of your current time now, the evolution is going to be given by some system model. Um, MPC mostly uses linear dynamics on the inside for computational tractability, as we'll see in the next few slides. Uh, let's assume for now, this is the kind of a model that we're interested in. It's going to take in constraints on the state of the system. The state of the system could be the position, velocity, orientation of your car. It takes in constraints on the input, it could be throttle and steering constraints. And again, it has these optimization variables to take into account. So the problem for MPC, oh yeah, these constraints are not just for your current time step, but this K increments from zero going all the way to N, where zero is your current time step and N defines some um, time window for you. So if you're discretizing your system at a um, sampling time DT, N times DT is going to be how many seconds ahead your optimization is thinking or what we call the horizon of a model predictive control. So the problem is then defined by an objective that you're trying to minimize, could correspond to lap time or tracking error for a given trajectory and so on. You have an internal system model for your vehicle dynamics, and then you have constraints on the track, steering limits, et cetera. So let's briefly take a look at what kind of decision variables we are computing for MPC. And through this minimize, what are we getting through this minimization? All right, so usually we try to solve for a sequence of control actions, or let's say, you know, let's say um, pairs of acceleration and throttle at each time step, starting from now to some end time steps ahead. And also you could solve for your state predictions from now till the end of your time horizon. And that's what MPC is going to give you as an output. And what you see over here is, for example, starting at time t, you compute your control signals going all the way from T to T plus NP, which is let's say your prediction horizon. And you get some predicted states or predicted outputs shown through the blue line that is trying to track a reference. What you have done through solving the MPC optimization 
you know, again, we'll see in detail what the components of the MPC optimization are, but let's say someone gives that to you and you solve it, is you've computed an open loop sequence of controls. By open loop, we mean we haven't applied them to the plant yet. Your dynamics could be different. They could be uh, different from the one that you're using in the model. There could be noise in the system. So your closed loop behavior when you apply these signals might be different from what you're predicting in an open loop manner. So the first thing is MPC is to begin with an open loop optimization. And you have predicted, you have essentially computed your controls from time step now till some end of the horizon capital N. The next question then is, how do we use this for closed loop control? Because that's what we want to do. And for that, we're going to use this thing called receding horizon control, which is essentially an algorithm to use MPC in closed loop. It's a very simple idea. You start by taking in your current state or your measurement at time step T. Let's say you start off uh, time step T, which is over here, and you compute your control sequence all the way from time step T to T plus N. So let's say this point of time is T plus N or the end of your horizon. The optimizer is going to give you what this optimal sequence is. What you're do, going to do is you're going to apply your first control input. So for example, you apply what your first acceleration and throttle is. That is the stage over here written by do. So that's your apply the first control input. And then you repeat the process. You get another state estimate, which is over here. You get a measurement, a time step T plus one. You now solve your optimization again with the N step look ahead. So now instead of solving T plus N, you solve to T plus N plus one, apply your first control input, repeat the process and repeat and so on until the end of your event. So in this way, um, what we've done is we have taken our open loop optimization and turned it into a closed loop controller by taking in the measurement and then accounting for the measurement because your state could have moved more than what your um, prediction was saying it was going to. And we call this a receding horizon approach because if you sit at time T and you look at where the horizon of your MPC is, it's going to go further and further away from you as time progresses. So we call this the receding horizon approach. Anyway, this is how you're going to be applying MPC in a closed loop manner. Um, any questions so far before we get into some more details? Yeah, this question. Cool. Professor, so you're assuming here that we do have the control input at time at time t equals zero, right? For me to uh, use that here. But so, since it's an optimization problem, won't it take me some time for me to get the control input itself? So how do I do the do action without me performing the optimization? That's a good point. So right now we are assuming there is no um, computation delay. And so let's say you start off at time zero, you can instantaneously compute a control. You're right, there are usually some delays. And but, you know, if, again, you can solve MPC in a fast enough manner, as you'll see later on, that those, those delays won't practically matter. If you do want to take them into account, there are modeling tricks that will let you uh, account for that delay as well. Um, but for now, just think that the computation is fast enough that you don't really need to bother about the compute delay. But yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, if you solve it for like, you know, you can solve it at 50 cycles, 50 hertz, and that's fast enough. So. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, you can, depending on your system, you can solve it at tens of hertz, which should be enough. And maybe at the end, I'll show you a slide that you can also do MPC for nanosecond rate updates if you have to, for certain kinds of systems. Any other again, questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, um, not let's move on then. So yeah, so MPC is an optimization. It gives you an open loop sequence of control signals to be applied, and you can apply them in closed loop by doing this receding horizon method. All right, now let's take a deeper look into each of the components of MPC. The first is your objective function that you're trying to minimize. Um, we call it a cost function or an objective. We divide it into um, two parts. The first part, um, actually let me go one by one, is a penalty for your how much your state is deviating from a given reference. So X of K over here is your state at time step K. And XR is your reference or your desired state that you want to be at. Think of it as, say you're tracking a trajectory. So this could be a sequence of positions and velocities. So you have a state error and then you have a penalty matrix for the state errors. So Q over here is a positive semi-definite matrix. Positive semi-definite means that its eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero. Um, this is 
one design restriction that your matrices have to be positive semi-definite or positive definite. And that gives you a quadratic penalty over your state error for your entire um, horizon. So you see the sum, the sum is going from time step zero, which is where you are right now, to time step n minus one, which is the end of your horizon. Similarly, you also have a, a penalty term for how much control effort you're putting in. For example, if you're doing a lot of steering or if you're applying a lot of throttle, you kind of want to penalize that as well. So you can penalize that through a quadratic term on U, which is your control input. Um, R over here is your weight again, and this weight matrix has to be positive definite. That is all eigenvalues have to be greater than zero, which essentially means you should penalize all your control inputs a little bit. You can't have any control input that is not penalized. Otherwise, it leads to numerical instabilities. And also you lose a bunch of guarantees. Um, finally, you also have a terminal state error or a cost for the state that you get at the end of your MPC horizon when you're doing things in open loop. Um, I guess the question over here is why do we need to have it? Um, you won't see the answer in these slides, but the answer is you want to get some strong guarantees on uh, stability of your model predictive controller. So that's why you have a terminal cost as well. In general, if you look at this cost function, it's a quadratic function and it's going to be convex because Q, QN and R all have eigenvalues greater than zero. So something to keep in mind when you design your cost function, but usually we'll think about quadratic cost functions when we design model predictive control. All right, um, so that was the cost or the objective part of MPC. So maybe let's go back a couple of slides. Right, so MPC has a cost function, right? That's the that what you're minimizing. And then you have a bunch of constraints in model predictive control that your variables should satisfy. So now let's talk about those constraints. The first constraint is that you have to use the right model for your system um, because you want to predict what's going to happen all the way to n time steps ahead. So we'll work with a model. Often uh, times we'll work with linear time invariant or LTI systems. If you've taken ESC 500 on a linear systems class, you should know what this is. If not, um, we'll briefly talk about them at the end of the lecture. So yeah, you, you have these dynamics that will tell you what your next state or given your current state at time k and your input at time k, um, what your next state at time step k plus one should be. And you're going to apply this for each of your time steps. So this is a model that we'll use on the inside of MPC to predict our behaviors. Um, right. And of course, we'll have these constraints on two consecutive states to relate the state evolution in a continuous manner. That is, um, you know, that your current state is going to be impacted by your previous state and the previous input. Usually we have these kind of Markovian behaviors, but you could also have uh, regression models where your state is a function of not just the previous time step, but maybe some memory before that as well. Um, this question over here is what if you don't have these constraints on the dynamics? What kind of you know, what kind of trajectories could you generate then? Does anybody want to take a guess at you know, why we why these constraints are very important? My first guess is that it's because nonlinear dynamics are much slower to uh, to calculate. So, like it was brought up before, the delay issue you run into issues with that, and also just nonlinear equations are not, are not friendly. Um, so right now we are only restricting ourselves. To, let's say the system is actually linear. Let's say there okay, are no actually, linear dynamics. Hmm. So the question is why, why should we have this constraint when we try to predict what's going to happen the next time step, time step after that, and so on? Oh, well, in that case, it's just because the, the uh, it'll, ask for, it'll ask for inputs that would uh, break the dynamics and it won't actually know what it's doing. Yeah, that's kind of the answer. Yes, uh, you want to generate dynamics that your car, you want to pre have predictions that your car can, oh, by the way, thank you uh, to the student who gave the answer. Um, you want to predict your states in a way that the car can actually drive through them, which is why you have to connect the state from one time step to the next using your dynamics. So it's very important to have these dynamics constraints in your MPC. Otherwise you're solving pretty much a meaningless problem. And right, uh, we use LTI. I think the first part of what the answer was, was that, we're going to use linear time invariant systems because they're, uh, they lead to convex optimizations, which can be solved easily, as opposed to if you use the actual nonlinear dynamics for your car, it'll make the MPC much more computationally intractable. So, but yeah, we'll get to that. In fact, if you think about these dynamics, uh, we start off with some nonlinear dynamics. For example, these are non-holonomic uh, dynamics for your vehicle with a steering angle delta and a fixed velocity V. 
um, it has states, your positions in X, Y are your orientation, and also, again, your inputs are your velocity and let's say um, steering angle delta. It's a nonlinear system, and we don't want to throw it directly to the MPC. This also is a continuous time system. You don't get the next state, but what you're looking at over here is the time derivative of these physical quantities. So if we say x dot, we really mean uh, bx by dt, or the rate of change of a variable with time, similarly for the rest of them. And again, this is not something we can throw directly to an optimizer. So what we're going to do is we're going to first linearize the system, come up with an ordinary differential equation, and then further, we're going to discretize it. And I'll answer the question over here. It has to be discretized because again, we, if you're writing an optimization, there have to be a finite number of constraints. So if we want to talk about n time steps ahead, we should have n states. And so we're going to discretize our dynamics in time. All right, so those were the first type of constraints which are for your dynamics. You can also have other constraints on your state and input. For example, you could have actuator limits that a steering angle has to be within say minus pi by three and pi by three. Um, your car can't go any faster than 20 miles per hour. You want to take that into account because you don't want to plan trajectories that go all the way to 50 miles per hour when you know your car can't actually go that fast. You also want to take into account things like your track boundaries or other cars on the track. And so the way we're going to represent these constraints is through the polyhedral form AX less than equal to B. Um, so yeah, I think what's shown over here are some kind of polyhedral constraints that you could have. For example, you have a car with a cone that it's going to try to stay within or try to stay within the boundaries of the track by looking at these two, um, essentially stay within these lines. These lines are called half spaces because they break your space, uh, they divide them into half. If you are on the left side of it or the right side of this half space, you get half of your entire um, 2D space. And you want to stay within these uh, kind of lines. The intersection of these half spaces is what defines a polyhedron. We can write this in matrix form as AX less than or equal to B, where A is a matrix of an appropriate size, B is a vector, and X could be your vector for your state or your input, or you can concatenate it all together, put it into one vector. But in general, for our model predictive control algorithm, when we say constraints of the kind that our state is within a set X or our input is within a set U, um, these X and U are going to be polyhedrons or polytopes if they're bounded. And again, this is in order to keep, um, at the end of the day, you want to have a computationally tractable optimization to solve, which is why we're going to use these kind of constraints. All right, yeah, let's put it all together then. We have the MPC in a following form. We have a quadratic cost function to be minimized. As we saw, there's a terminal state error. I think terminal state error has been written twice. This is not terminal state, but just state error. Um, you have some, penalty on how much actuator effort you're going to implement. And then you have constraints. The first constraint is start at the right state. So take in your feedback or we'll start with where you are um, at time zero. Then you use your dynamics to update what your next steps are going to be. You can then have some polyhedral constraints for, for example, staying within the track and for keeping your control within some given bounds. So, um, right. Um, this is one example of a MPC with a convex optimization, linear constraints. Some questions. Uh, on the previous slide, you were showing the state constraints. And so mm -hmm. my question is, isn't it fairly easy for that, for that constraint to become non-convex given like we don't know the shape of the racetrack? Yes. That's a, that? Okay. That's have, a great question. Do you yes, have any suggestions uh, to avoid that? Yes. And we'll see this when we, well, actually, we won't see this in this class, but there'll be a reference to the model predictive controlling control paper. And in there, they come up with these um, ways in order to convexify your track. Think of it this way, you're, um, as you move along the track, you want to keep a look ahead that only cares about some you know, vicinity in front of you. And for that, you can find the right half spaces to stay within. Like um, in this third figure over here, let me put the pointer. If you're at, let's say this position in the track, let's say all the way to the left, you maybe just want to stay within these two lines, right? Which are, which will define a convex constraint. Next up, as you get closer to the curve, you could take the track and find a linear under approximation of it by finding, you know, let's say the tangent lines to your track boundaries. And that's going to define a half space to stay within. Similarly, as you move along, just keep on finding the tangent, stay within it. So now update your constraints at each 
point in time. So that's one heuristic that you could use to get convex constraints. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you. That was a good question. Yeah, and these kind of things will be covered in more detail in the uh, reference for MPCC. I think that's what you folks will be using for, as an implementation as well. So, um, but yeah, for now, assume someone at a higher level gives you, some oracle tells you what your convex constraints are to work with. So those are going to be your tax track constraints. And yeah, they could be changing over time as we just talked about. They're not necessarily time invariant. All right, so we can put all this together in an optimization. And the question then is how do we solve this optimization problem? Um, long story short is that we're going to throw it to existing optimization solvers. And let's take a look at what some of them can do for you. So on the inside, we'll be using quadratic uh, solvers. And so just to give you a quick overview of quadratic programming, you're looking at a quadratic cost where Z is your optimization variable. So you're doing this minimization over Z. Uh, Z is in some dimension Rn. H is a square matrix that has to be greater than zero. Um, that is positive definite. G is a vector that gives you um, some affine term or a linear term to ha have as well. And you can have upper and lower bounds on Z based on some constraint matrix AC. So this should be AC. So this is what a general quadratic program looks like. Model predictive control also fits into this category. We saw it. It has a quadratic cost. It's got linear constraints. Now all we need to do is massage it into a form that we can write it in this form essentially, define H, G, A, C, L, B, and U, B for MPC, and then throw it to a standard solver that can solve these kind of optimizations. Um, let's take one example of what a two-dimensional quadratic program would look like over variables Z1 and Z2, and some positive definite matrix H. So quadratic functions usually have this bowl-like shape, if you think of them in higher dimension. Um, and this is something that, again, uh, is obtained because you have a positive definite matrix H. Now, the property of quadratic solving quadratic programs is that gradient descent based methods, uh, well, uh, shown over here is the constraint set defined by the polyhedron by ACE, by this matrix A and the upper and lower bound. But essentially you have these linear polyhedral constraints and because the problem is convex, you, any minima is guaranteed to be a global minima. And so these methods can be solved quickly through gradient descent and you have nice convergence guarantees. So again, MPC with linear systems, linear constraints is a quadratic program and you can just solve it using off the shelf solvers. Um, right, so the next step then is how do we massage MPC into a form shown in these two equations on top? Essentially, we want to write it down as a quadratic program and we'll see what we need to do then in order to do that. But yeah, I guess the question is what happens when the constraints are non-convex? And the answer is nothing good. So we won't talk too much about that over here in this class. Oh, sorry, um, do you get rid of this message? Right, so yeah, uh, we can take our MPC. We'll see in the next few slides how we turn it into a quadratic program, but not all optimizations are easy to solve. Um, in general, we get away with a lot of things. If we have an MPC that can have linear dynamics, linear constraints, there are a bunch of um, solvers that can solve uh, essentially these kind of problems almost in real time. You could use tools like CVXGen, which is an online tool that will generate C code for you, which you can directly send to a microcontroller or implement it however you want. Write up, wrap it in a ROS node if you want to. Um, works for systems with a few states and a small horizon, simple constraints. You could also use OSQP or solvers like Quadprog. If you do want to deal with non-convex optimizations, because let's say you're feeling adventurous, then Cassidy is a great tool. Uh, it's open source, you can, and it has support for MATLAB, Python, and C++ interfaces to state-of-the-art non-convex optimization solvers as well. So yeah, it's a, again, if you want to um, do non-convex MPC, Cassidy is a great tool for that. Um, there are also other tools like MPT3 from ETH Zurich. It's a MATLAB tool that's great for MPC design, analysis, especially for linear systems, even for linear time varying systems. And it also does deployment for you. If you want to generate C code, it can do that for some classes of simple linear systems as well. Um, and I guess in this class, uh, OSQP is the recommended solver. I guess the lab instructors can tell you more about that. But anyway, um, talking about quadratic programming because MPC can be turned into a quadratic program and then it can be solved um, through off the shelf solvers. And so now let's see how do we get MPC into a nice quadratic programming standard form. 
All right, so now let's fill in the blanks over here. The question is, how do we convert MPC into a QP? Started off with the MPC in the following form. We have a quadratic objective over variables that are both the state and the input, so X and U. We have equality constraints uh, for our dynamics and the initial state, and we have some inequality constraints that might define, for example, constraints on the state, track boundaries, constraints on the input, and so on. Standard quadratic program, on the other hand, is given in the following form, where you're working with a single optimization variable Z, it's in some higher dimension, Rn, let's say. So you have a quadratic form of that, and you want to write constraints in the form that, essentially, these two polyhedral forms, that ACZ is less than equal to UB, and ACZ is greater than or equal to LB. So there's a lower bound and an upper bound on what these variables can take or what linear combinations of these variables can take. So again, this is a quadratic form, and this is a linear polyhedral constraint. And again, these kind of problems are called convex quadratic programs. MPC fits the bill, but we need to do some massaging in order to find an H in terms of the Q and the R matrices, for example, find AC, LB, and UB in terms of the A and B matrices or the U min, U max that we have over here. So the next few slides, we just talk about what kind of bookkeeping it takes in order to get that form. Again, this is not something you're expected to see out of the box and recognize, but as you start writing down your own MPC, you will see yourself going through these kind of steps. All right, the question is, how do we do it? Um, and we'll take a simplified form of the MPC where our state constraints X and some set X are just upper and lower bounded by X min and X max. If they're of a different polyhedral form, a similar um, approach will work. You'll just see different kinds of uh, edge, uh, you'll see different um, AC matrices compared to what you're going to see in the next few slides. Right, so we're going to take our MPC optimization, write it into this compact matrix form, essentially stack up all our constraints, stack up the objective in the right form, and then come up with a simple compact form. As I alluded to, a lot of this is just bookkeeping. So the edge matrix can be given through a diagonal matrix that has Q, Q, uh, and going all the way to QN in your diagonal elements. It also then has the appropriate number of Rs. So essentially there's going to be N of these Q matrices because you had N time steps in your MPC. So if you go back to the sum and you take a look at it again, it's going as a sum that goes from zero to N minus one. This is your terminal cost, so that's your terminal penalty, QN, and you will have NR matrices that correspond to penalizing N of your control inputs. So in MATLAB, you can simply come up with this giant edge matrix by using the diagonal uh, command or the DIAG command. G over here is going to be a linear term that's going to take into account your reference part. So remember, we had a cost function that was of the kind that it's XK minus X reference, transpose Q, oops, XK minus X reference, and you are summing this up. So you have those reference terms and we can just take those away and get the linear form for them as shown over here in G. All right, so again, if you don't understand what's happening exactly, you don't have to worry about it too much, but you will worry about it once you start to implement some of this on your own. The second part then are the constraints. How do we take our dynamic constraints and the state, state and input constraints and map them to um, this compact form shown over here. And in order to do that, we'll essentially just take our constraints one by one and write them down in a vector form. So as an example, let's take a look at the first of these constraints. So remember our vector Z is our states X zero, X one, all the way to Xn plus N, followed up by u0 all the way to un. So oops, if I stack it up, that's going to be my vector z. And what the first row over here is saying, let's just focus on the first row. And if I multiply the first row with the vector z, I'm just going to get x0 out of it, or minus x0. And what this is saying is that the first row says identity times x0 is less than or equal to minus x0, greater than or equal to minus x0. Or essentially, this is forcing the fact that x of zero should be, um, you should again, initialize with the right measurement or with the right initial state. 
So that's what the first row here is going to tell you. Similarly, if you take a look at the second row, it's going to give you a state update equation. It's going to tell you that x1 is ax0 plus bu0. That's the second row. The third row is going to give you x2 is ax1 plus bu1 and so on. So that's all the way till here. And then below this, you have your constraints for essentially, as you see, x is less than equal to x max and x is less than equal to, sorry, uh, greater than equal to. And x is greater than equal to x min. So if you go through these rows, that's all you'll get out of the first um, n rows over here. The others are just saying that u is less than equal to u max and greater than equal to u min. So again, just a lot of bookkeeping, but you can take your MPC with your linear constraints, polyhedral constraints, which are equalities and inequalities, and then turn them into the uh, polyhedral form as shown over here. So with that, what we have done is essentially gone um, from our MPC form into our standard quadratic programming form. Um, any questions so far? Before we move on to some of the implementation details on how you would do this for F110. All right, cool. So no questions it usually happens when you get into the math. And again, I wouldn't expect you to see this right away and be able to um, grasp all of it. But if you go back and work it out one row at a time, you'll see that you're going to recover the same constraints that we had in the MPC. And if you see that some of these upper and lower bounds have a bunch of zeros, that essentially is forcing an equality constraint. So I wrote it in the form that X1 is equal to AX0 plus BU0. But what this is really saying, like for example, this constraint is really saying is that uh, x minus x1 plus ax0 plus bu0 is less than or equal to zero, and it's greater than or equal to zero. So again, this is just force the equality that x1 is equal to ax0 plus bu0, which is a linear dynamical system. So right, so go offline and work this uh, through after the class just to get a better idea of what these constraints are. But through this exercise, we'll have turned our MPC into a standard quadratic program. And through that, you can throw it to any solver of choice and come up with your sequence of control signals um, that are going to be optimal for this system. And then we'll apply it in the receding horizon manner that we saw before. That is, apply the first control input, wait for the next time step, get your feedback, recompute the optimization, apply the first control input again, redo the process. And so you'll have your optimization working in a closed loop manner for you. All right, cool. So, so far what we've covered are some of the basics of MPC, um, so the underlying math. And now let's see some MPC implementations or variants of MPC that are specific to the F110 or in more generally, I guess, to autonomous driving or autonomous racing. So in the first video that you saw in the applications, we were talking about this hierarchical model predictive control structure. And well, I think this paper uh, shown in the, with the link in the bottom, this is going to be a reference that you should visit if you have more questions about what's going on on the inside. For example, questions on how to pick the right track constraints, how to make them linear, given your track could be an arbitrary curve. Um, so that's, this paper has two methods um, that we're going to talk about over here. The first is, a hierarchical structure for planning and control. First, at a higher level, you have a path planner that's going to pick a trajectory that let's say maximizes progress given um, some pre-computed racing line or a center line. So it, you could use a high-level path planner like let's say RRT star, if you want to discretize your space A star, although I wouldn't recommend that, um, or any other lattice-based planner or whatever. And you have a high-level planner that's going to pick a trajectory that maximizes some notion of progress. That's the first level. The second level is a low-level model predictive control that's going to now try to track the trajectory best it can while remaining within the track, maybe avoiding static obstacles and so on. And that's going to be formulated in a, again, you'll see that can be formulated as a model predictive controller. So that's the first hierarchical way of kind of doing autonomous driving around a racetrack. 
The idea is that first, in order to generate your um, higher level trajectories, you can take your velocities, steering angles, um, maybe not track positions, but velocities and steering angles and discretize them in a grid where um, let's say the rows represent steering angles and your columns represent your different speeds that you could have. And for each of these combinations, a trajectory of some time horizon N can be simulated just by integrating the dynamics. So this is the high level path plan or the first level of your um, hierarchical approach. So you're just essentially taking some reference velocity and some reference steering angle, connecting them, integrating them over your dynamics. Your dynamics again are just your linear dynamics or could be a nonlinear um, dynamics for the vehicle. And you get a bunch of trajectories that could look, for example, like the ones shown over here in green and black. Um, and yeah, some of them are going along the racing line, which is the line in the center that we should care about. So let's call this the, oops, sorry. Um, this is the center line along which you're going to measure progress. And so some of these trajectories are better than the others when it comes to making progress along the center line. Some of these trajectories are also pretty bad. They're infeasible that you won't be able to stay in the track if you try to follow them. Anyway, um, yeah, an important point is that each trajectory has constant speed and constant steering angle because you're just doing a forward integration, by picking one point in your discretized grid of velocities and angles. But again, uh, this is just one heuristic to generate a high level uh, trajectory. You could use RRT star with non holonomic dynamics for your car, it would do something similar for you. So yeah, at a high level, you've generated some trajectories. The next question is, which trajectory should I pick? And the question after that is, how do I track it? So the first question, how do I pick a trajectory is first, you of course want to maximize a notion of progress along the track center line. So theta star over here is uh, the projection of the best trajectory onto your racing line. Um, theta is a measure of progress that's going to be from zero to L or sometimes from zero to one, where zero means, sorry, zero means you're at the start of the track. L means you've come all the way around and are at the finish line. Um, but you need to have a center line before and of course, in order to be able to do this. And then you see you have multiple um, trajectories over here. Um, like for example, the black trajectories, they're fine. Let's focus on the red and the orange one. The red one, over here, of course, is infeasible with respect to your track. So you definitely don't want to follow that one. The orange one, on the other hand, is what we'll pick as the best one. Uh, it's not Maybe it's not the optimal one because we had gridded our space of angles and velocities, but you get one um, of these trajectories that we say is the best or makes the most project, uh, makes, makes the most progression when projected on your center line. And we'll pick that as our candidate trajectory. So now in our hierarchical planner at the first level, we have essentially picked a trajectory by generating many and picking the best one that makes most progress. And now given this trajectory, we can take MPC then to follow the trajectory. So we can write down the following MPC where X ref essentially are points along our trajectory. and points along our optimal trajectory, the, the one that we found previously. And so we penalize um, essentially deviation from that, take into account your system dynamics, your track constraints, uh, your input constraints, and then you solve the optimization. So you're going to, MPC is essentially then going to track your trajectory. It's going to minimize deviation while satisfying all your track constraints. Um, one example of that is shown over here, uh, for example, the green line is the reference trajectory, maybe the best one that makes progress along the center line, but um, you also have to take into account obstacles now, which is something we weren't talking about previously. So um, the green line is your reference trajectory. Yellow dots are solution from the MPC, which minimize your deviation from the reference trajectory while also respecting your constraints. So now your constraints also include obstacles. And red lines are feasible half spaces defined by um, essentially regions between, convex regions between these half spaces are what you can pick as um, constraints for your MPC. So you could have multiple MPCs solved to be solved over here. But again, uh, go to the reference, uh, the archive paper to find out more about what's happening in here, for example. But yeah, you could have a high level planner to generate trajectories and your MPC at the lower level to follow those trajectories while 
in the best manner while also being safe um, given your constraints. So that's the first or the hierarchical method for using um, MPC essentially to track trajectories to race around a given track. Um, let's maybe take a look at the demo again that we saw before. So this is again the two level or the hierarchical MPC. And in red, you have your track constraints. Green is the reference, yellow is the actual line that you're following. As you can see, um, there are these different constraints that you can pick from. And again, the, there are some heuristics to pick the right ones. And then you stay within those constraints, or the tightest bound within those constraints, drive around the track while being safe. So this is one method that you'll see in the paper. I think it's the first method covered in the second section. Um, any questions about MPC for this, uh, this hierarchical MPC algorithm so far? Uh, could you please explain more about the green line, the reference trajectory, how, um, I mean, uh, the definition of that? Okay, so the green line is going to be one of the best, uh, it's going to be the best trajectory that we generate at a high level. So maybe let me sketch out the architecture for what it looks like. You have a um, trajectory generator or a high level planner. It's going to generate a bunch of trajectories. So it's many trajectories uh, shown over here, right? It's a bunch of trajectories. You pick the best one. Um, through some heuristic, which could be, for example, projection along a center line. And you send this trajectory as a reference for MPC to track. Um, now, generating these trajectories could be through many ways. Uh, RRT star could be one, or you could follow the heuristic presented over in the first bulleted point, which is take your possible velocities for the car, discretize them, let's say, at intervals of five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, 15, 20 miles per hour, take multiple steering angles, for example, going from minus pi by three to plus pi by three in some increments of let's say 10 degrees. And essentially just forward simulate your dynamics for that, which you can do because you know the dynamics of the car. If you know your constant velocity, constant steering angle, you can kind of see what these trajectories would be. Plot all of them, project them onto the center line. And as the next slide shows you, um, the one that makes the most progress along the center line is going to be your reference trajectory for your MPC to track. So again, it's one heuristic, sure you can come up with something better, but this is how you would generate your um, high level reference trajectory. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. One more, some more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the earlier slides, uh, I think there was, there are some, the darker black lines. Is there any uh, significance to those? Why they're shorter? It could be for different velocities. So think of it as I've discretized my velocities into two okay. points, like five and 10 miles per hour. So the black lines are five, green lines are 10. Okay. Yeah, let's go. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so for the red lines, which you show in the simulation, uh, can you go to that slide? I, I, I didn't, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. So for, for the red lines that you show in, I mean, in all the pictures, Mm -hmm. uh, are these, uh, so they, you said uh, half space constraints, uh, but I think uh, on, on the on the slide twenty seven, uh, could you go to twenty seven? Twenty seven. So yes. the so the half space constraint on your uh, mid picture, it mm -hmm. seems like it's a projection of your center line point red dot in, in your center line, uh, but it's uh, just lies directly on the on, on the track. So why it's I mean, in a simulation, it does not lie on the track. It's on the, I mean, on the some, somewhere inside the track. Well, because the simulation is using some other kind of heuristics. But anyway, so these constraints, for example, in slide 27, they come not from the center line, but they're more, you just drawing the tangent to your edges of your racetrack. And those tangents are going to define lines that you should stay within. Again, this is one heuristic. For more details, I would refer to the archive paper. So we don't have time to go into the details of what's going on in there. Um, what's happening in the simulation, though, is you have those multiple lines uh, because you have these different obstacles. So you have all of these different half spaces. You also see that you have some of these lines that are on the track boundaries as well. So again, part of this is visualization. These lines aren't visualized perfectly. Now, if you take the intersection of all of these half spaces, you'll see that a bunch of these constraints are redundant. 
for example, if I uh, talk about this constraint over here and this constraint, these constraints are redundant because you have tighter um, parallel, pretty much parallel lines like uh, this one and this one to consider, right? So mm -hmm. what's kind of shown over here is that the heuristic is generating a bunch of half spaces that you should be within. You'll be within the intersection of them, which is going to be the tightest possible space. Um, okay. So, and then as you move forward, you kind of recompute these lines and stay within again, the tightest possible space over here. Okay. See. Um, uh, Professor, so it does seem like uh, going back to the receding horizon problem, uh, mm -hmm. we are we are we are optimizing over a time interval, right? So, like, is there a heuristic on what could be like, what should be that time interval taken for me to optimize upon? Because it seems like since if we are going for feedback, the the smaller time interval I take, the better it is. Since I'm just uh, going back to the, I mean, since I'm enforcing that my State estimation for for I mean state for the state at the time I, I apply my next control input should be the state I start with. So okay. I see your question. Um, right. So first thing about MBC is that the longer the time horizon, the better your performance. Because you know, absent any disturbances and mismatches, you're predicting for a longer time. And so you can take actions that are going to be optimal um, you know, over your entire horizon. Essentially, you want to have infinite time optimal control. Um, now, it might seem that a smaller time horizon is better because you're using feedback, but that's not necessarily the case. In order to pick what the right horizon is, it depends on a lot of factors. There's heuristics, for example, on, uh, again, it depends on what kind of estimates of disturbances do you have. For example, you might be limited by your sensor data. And so that may kind of artificially restrict how big your horizon can be. Another thing to consider is your computation time, which was brought up by a student earlier on. Um, the longer the horizon, the more optimization variables to deal with. And so the slower your optimization is going to be. For example, if I solve an optimization with 100 over 100 time step horizon versus the 10 time step horizon, the 10 time step horizon is going to be much faster. So your compute power, your prediction, and also your model mismatch, these are three things that define how big your horizon can be. And the third thing, uh, the fourth thing over there is also like what kind of formal guarantees you're trying to get from model predictive control. I think that's beyond the scope of this lecture. So um, essentially try to keep it as long as you can computationally handle. So uh, so in case of like, let's say I'm, I'm just building it for racing and I don't care how erratic my, my, my trajectory is, I just want it to be fast. So in that case, a smaller one would, 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 would be better. Um, it, it would be better in terms of computation time. It won't. It still won't be better in terms of performance because if you go back to the MPC objective, right? Let's say you're trying to minimize um, deviation from a reference trajectory. The more look ahead you have, the better you'll be able to do, because you know you come up with maybe smoother trajectories that stay close to this, um, that converge more quickly to the reference rather than if you have a small look ahead, you might have jerky trajectories that move around and then converge slowly. So again. Um, Longer also, horizon, better. Also, is there a reason why I'm why I'm having a penalty for my control input? It's just saying that I don't I don't want to put some effort, or yeah. So no. this is for uh, the first thing is this is for the stability of model predictive control. If you don't have uh, any penalty, then you will have large control actions that might lead to very oscillatory behavior when applied to real systems. I also, see. when you do the formal um, stability analysis of model predictive control, you realize that R actually has to be a positive definite matrix. Uh, if you've taken an optimal control class and done some linear quadratic regulator, you'll see how a similar requirement on the R matrix in LQR. So it kind of comes from that, that you want to have stability of the system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, some more questions. I uh, just wanted to ask, what would happen if uh, the uh, reference trajectory is not feasible? <laughs> uh, it's not feasible as in it's going into a wall or something? Yes. Well, then, if you have imposed the feasibility constraint in here, um, sorry, my pen has stopped working for some reason. No, there we go. Let's say you have your track boundaries in here. Then what you will essentially come up with is a trajectory that tries to track your, your actual trajectory will try to track your reference as close to possible while staying within the track. Um, if I were to kind of sketch it out, let's say you're trying to track the trajectory in red, right? Um, one of your candidate trajectories could be, I'll use the color blue uh, to sketch it out. 
this could be a candidate trajectory that MPC makes, or this could be a candidate trajectory that MPC makes. So it's going to be optimal with respect to tracking the red line while respecting the safety constraints. So it's kind of on you to impose both at a high level and if you impose it at a high level, great. If not, at the low level, you should impose that your track boundaries are respected. Even if we have an obstacle that's blocking the track, we might turn around and go the other way. Um, in that case, you'll have to kind of find the right constraints. For example, in the uh, if you look at the obstacles over here and you see there's a bunch of candidate constraints, and of course we pick the tightest one, but then it's on you to kind of figure out how you will compute these constraints. Okay. Turning around, very much. Any other questions? No, these are great questions. Yeah, keep them coming. That's it. All right, great. Uh, all right, so we just saw this demo. So, so far, what we've seen is MPC for trajectory tracking, which is a higher level trajectory generator, generates a bunch of candidate trajectories, could have a bunch of issues with them, but your, then your lower level MPC is going to track those trajectories to the best of its ability while respecting your constraints the way you've imposed them. Because constraint design in MPC is a big problem and it's very subjective. So it comes down to what problem you're dealing with and you know what kind of domain expertise can you bring to it. But of course, we can also use MPC then for not just trajectory tracking, but for generating candidate trajectories that are correct by construction beforehand rather than coming up with trajectories that maybe can't be tracked perfectly or hit a wall at a higher level, get rid of the higher level controller and instead come up with a formulation that generates trajectories and tracks them at the same time. Essentially a local planner. And in order to do that, we'll uh, refer to the paper again that does model predictive controlling, contouring control or MPCC for racing. Um, this is a paper based on the 143rd scale Orca cars. Again, you'll find the link in the slides. Uh, it's actually, yeah, it's the reference over here. So yeah, MPC, of course, in terms of racing, can do a lot more than just tracking control. Um, not just in racing, but for many autonomous systems, including like in my research with Rahul, aerial robots, we generated a bunch of trajectories for very complex looking specifications using an MPC-like algorithm. Um, so it can be used as a local or even a global trajectory planner. The cost can be, of course, formulated in a way that it still encourages maximizing progress along the center line, and constraints should be for safety. And we'll take a look at one particular appro approach that essentially kind of exploits the geometry of the track and the car to uh, formulate an MPC that will generate local trajectories for you. That approach is called Model Predictive Contouring Control or MPCC. Um, if you go to the reference, uh, it's the second method in it, I think section three or section four. So it does a very good overview of what's happening inside MPCC. The idea is first to now think about trajectories. So take your center line and do a cubic uh, spline fitting to it. So theta again is a parameter that talks about progress made along the center line. It's going to be between zero and L. Uh, L is the, again, you're all the way back to the racing line, zero is your starting point. Um, so what you want to write down is X ref and Y ref. So these are third um, order polynomials. of theta along with some a bunch of constraints, similarly for y as well. And so these third of the polynomials are what are going to define your center line. So think of this as x ref and y ref parameterized by theta. So let's say this is your start finish straight. So you will have theta equal to zero over here. As you go all the way along the track, come back, you will have theta equal to L as you reach the finish line. So as you increment theta, um, if you evaluate X ref and Y ref, this polynomial is going to give you the racing line that's going around um, what looks like the M lab and the other spaces in the second floor of Levine. Now with this kind of formulation, you also get a good kind of a reference uh, orientation to track for free, which is phi of theta, which is a tangent to the path at your reference point. And it's going to be the angle with respect to the X axis. So if there were a couple of axes, this is your X axis, think of this as your Y axis. So again, um, first we'll start off by just, uh, fitting a cubic spline to our center line. And again, this may not be an exact fit to the center line because you're restricted your splines to being third order polynomials. But this is what we'll start off with. Sorry. Um, then the objective for model predictive control is to minimize the notion of deviation from the center line while maximizing 
progress or how far away you are going to go along the center line, which is why you have this kind of an objective where the first term, and we'll talk a little bit more about what these are. This is your deviation that is to be minimized. And the second thing is progress that is to be maximized, which is why you see you have a negative sign over here because you essentially want to maximize it. But on the outside, you're solving an optimization that has a min on it. So you know, minimizing a negative number, a negative um, function is the same as maximizing uh, the positive version of that function. Gamma greater than zero is like a trade-off parameter over here. It tells you how much do you care about making progress along the center line to staying close to it. Because you could be very far away from the center line and make a lot of drastic progress, but then you know um, maybe you're going slower in the process over there. So you want to stay close to the racing line or the center line and make progress along it. So gamma lets you kind of trade off these two things. Um, and the constraints then are kind of the same. You start off with your feedback or your initial state to start off with. Um, you have some dynamics. We use the general nonlinear form of dynamics over here. Again, we linearize them. You have your constraints for the track, for example. That's given in the polyhedral form shown over here, um, shown as a time varying polyhedron. So these are time varying constraints, as you see, because they're indexed by small k, which is the time step in our horizon. And then, of course, you have state and input bounds. Um, for example, for steering, throttle, for velocity, acceleration, uh, orientation of the car, and so on. So what we're trying to do in MPCC is first come up with a nice representation of what deviation is, and essentially then turn all of this into, at the end of the day, a quadratic program to be solved that you can throw to a solver. So in order to do that, we'll rely on um, some geometric constructions as shown in the figure on the left. So you have a car, uh, you have its x, y coordinate, you have x, ref, and y, ref parameterized by theta. Um, you have theta p, which is a progress indicator. You have your angle phi, which is essentially the tangent to this. And then you have two kinds of errors that you should care about. So EC over here right now kind of shows you the deviation from the center line. So this is, uh, oops, deviation. And what we want to do is come up with um, a good way to compute what this is such that you can turn it into a quadratic objective. Now, you find more details in the paper, but the idea is to use a bunch of geometric tricks to approximate two kinds of errors. The first is a contouring error that essentially contouring error tells you how far away from the center line I am. And the second term that we have is lag error, which kind of tells you how far behind, um, you know, some reference look ahead point, um, or essentially uh, an indicator of progress, pretty much. So if you look at EC and EL, EC is your directly your deviation from your third order polynomial. So this is your um, third order polynomial in theta. As we saw before, it's a cubic spline. Um, you have EC, which tells you how far away from the spline you are. And you have EL that tells you how far beyond a reference point or a progress point you are as well. Um, if you look at EC and EL, these are kind of hard to write down mathematically. EC, not so much, but EL more so because it's along um, this arc. So what we first do is work with some approximations of this error. So we're going to approximate the contouring error and the uh, lag error given by the form shown over here. So this is, a, this is going to be your approximation of the two errors. Now, as you can see in your variables of interest, um, theta, y, and x, this is now a nonlinear form. So this approximations are still nonlinear. So this is not something you directly want to use in your MPC in the objective. But anyway, um, if, you go to, if you go into the paper, you'll see more details on how these things are worked out. Um, and yeah, I guess in the interest of time, we won't get too much into that. So yeah, you have these nonlinear approximations of what these two kinds of errors are for you know, closeness to the center line and progress. And then what we are going to do is essentially we linearize those error equations. So we saw those nonlinear equations and we'll use first order Taylor expansion, for example, to come up with a linear approximation of um, E hat C and E hat L. 
once we have that linear approximation, um, we'll essentially turn it into a quadratic objective to be minimized. So this over here, as you can see, is of the form summation of some error transpose Q times error, where error is a function of your states again. So it's going to be some X transpose QX. That's the first term. Um, you have the constraints that QC and QL should be greater than or equal to zero in order for this Q matrix to be positive semi-definite. You have, of course, your um, control penalty. So this is your control penalty. Again, um, R has to be a positive semi-definite um, term. And then you have, um, essentially, if you want to go fast, you can kind of maximize your, your um, not absolute value, but your maximize your positive value of speed. So that's kind of what you're trying to do over here. This could also be a progress indicator or whatever you want to use. So again, details are in the paper, but the idea is have this contouring error, lag error, they're nonlinear. So we linearize them. Once you linearize them, and you are, they're going to be linear in your variables of interest, throw it to an MPC and essentially replace this with some linear dynamics as well. And you'll have a quadratic program to work with, given you know, your X track is a convex constraint, a polyhedral constraints for the track, and your other constraints are nice and linear as well. So put that together, um, you've essentially come up with model predictive control, contouring control, which is both creating a local trajectory. So now you don't have to use RRT star or anything else to conduct, to create those bunch of uh, candidate trajectories. You essentially create the best one that's closest to the center line, making progress along it, and you're respecting your constraints as well. And with some uh, approximations and linearizations, you can turn this into a quadratic program to be solved. So that's what model predictive controlling is, uh, contouring control is. Uh, okay, so there's, we've talked about two kind of ideas for MPC for racing. First is hierarchical which is have a higher level trajectory generator plus MPC that only does trajectory following plus safety. The second is MPCC. That is where the MPC now acts as a local trajectory planner and also does uh, control on your own. So look at the reference for more details on both of these methods. I think you might be implementing one of these in the class, not entirely sure. Um, if you want to take into account things like obstacle avoidance at your higher level trajectory um, generator, you can use RRT star or A star to adjust these half space constraints that you're going to use as um, X track or your candidates or your constraint set for X in your MPC. So you can use these kind of other approaches to guide your MPC as well. Okay, so before we dive into the basics, any questions about that? Yeah, there's a question. In one of the slides, you said the track constraints were uh, time-based. And mm -hmm. my question is, wouldn't they be more state or space-based? Because if the track doesn't change with time, it changes based on where you are in the track. Yeah. So I was wondering um, if there's like a way to formulate that properly or maybe more intuitively. That's a good point. Um, so they are going to be state-based, like you suggested. Uh, if they're a function of the state, then it becomes a non it's usually a nonlinear constraint, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is you want to then approximate it by something um, simpler. So which is why you, instead of using a state-based um, constraint, you'll kind of do some approximation of it, usually an under approximation of those constraints, such that you can turn it into a time varying. It doesn't have to be time varying, but you'll see it usually best given as a time varying um, set of constraints to work with. So again, this is all, it may not be all exact, but this is all in the interest of turning it into a quadratic program that you can actually solve. So you want okay. your constraints to be nice and linear. I, I assume it's explained probably more in more detail in the paper then? Yeah, yeah, the paper will um, give you some more details on that. Awesome, thank you. Great. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Okay, so yeah, these are two kind of approaches um, that use MPC for doing racing around the track. And again, um, the interest of time we had to speed through this, but more details are in the paper. And the paper also has other references that you can look at. Okay, cool. So in the last five minutes, let's talk about some of the basics of system dynamics or why we were using LTI or linear time invariant dynamics. Again, if you've taken ES, uh, ESC 500, then uh, all of this will not be news to you, but in case you haven't, it's good to kind of see a little bit about where these system dynamics are 
uh, where they come from and how do we represent them in a way that we can throw it to MPC. So we use what we call state space models or where we're talking about the evolution of a state over time. So you have some vector valued state, um, the time evolution of that or X dot is given by some function G of the state X and the input here. Um, the state, for example, for you could represent the position, velocity, acceleration, angular accelerations, orientations of your car. Inputs could be steering, throttle, or whatever else you're using. Um, and so the evolution of um, how the state is going to change over time as a function of the state right now and the input that you're applying right now is, uh, this can be written down as a set of, um, or a vector of ordinary differential equations. And we call this a state space model. Um, now, if you're talking about continuous time, then you have differential equations, but we want to, again, instead of working with a differential equation, we want to work with a difference equation for discrete time. Because again, we want to write a finite number of uh, constraints for our state at time step one, time step two, and so on for our MPC. So we'll work with the discrete time version of it. Um, again, you have discrete time state space models. They could be nonlinear as shown over here. You could have a state evolution model, xk plus one, which is the next state as a function of the current state xk and the current input uk. Um, if you've taken a machine learning class, think of this as a deterministic Markov decision process over continued or continuous valued state and inputs, for example. Um, and so you have this kind of representation of your discrete time system. You could also have an output or a measurement um, from the state. For example, for your car, you won't maybe have access to um, all your um, orientation to begin with. You will only have access to some derivatives of that. And then you have to pass that to some state estimator to get the actual orientation on the pose of a car. So why is a measurement which maybe masks some of the inputs or gets a linear combination or whatever of some of the states and so on. So we'll care about um, state update equation mostly. We won't worry about the output. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to write an output tracking MPC, you could do that as well um, by using an output function H, uh, usually just a matrix that masks the right states. Um, what we'll focus on are linear systems, in particular linear time invariant systems. So LTI or uh, linear time invariant and what time invariant means is that the A matrix and the B matrix over here for both discrete time and continuous time are not changing over time. So your dynamics at any point in time is going to be the same. So that's what um, LTI systems are. And again, these are the easiest type of systems you can throw to MPC. You could also use linear time varying systems or LTV systems where A and B are indexed by K, for example. So that, that's another class of um, linear systems, more general can also be used in MPC, but kind of lose some of the stability and feasibility guarantees from model protective control. So again, um, LTI systems are what you want to kind of use more often than not. You could talk about, um, I guess, when you talk about the ordinary differential equations, um, you're talking about the time evolution of state. So you also want to talk about what is the actual state that I have. And we can essentially this following a solution to ordinary differential equations. Um, I don't think there's any point getting into it too much, but one thing to note is that this can be used for discretization in time. And usually for linear systems, we have this property called exact discretization. Um, that is, if you have a continuous time system and you discretize it using this uh, solution to the linear ODE, um, you have behavior where at each of the sampling points for the discrete system, the state for the discrete system and the state for the not, uh, for the uh, continuous time system are going to be exactly the same. So that is exact linearization. Um, and you can do that again, MATLAB can do that for you, for example. So again, this is the only um, place where I think the solution to linear ODEs is going to be useful. Uh, most systems of course are nonlinear. Um, if you try to work out any dynamics from first principles, write down the physics of your car, for example, end up with a bicycle model, it's a nonlinear system nonlinear in your state and inputs. But again, we want to have an MPC that has only linear constraints. So what we'll do is we we'll linearize the system. And usually nonlinear systems can be approximated by linear systems in a small neighborhood, especially if nonlinear systems are not chaotic or unstable. 
um, then you can get away with linearization in more than a small neighborhood. But the idea then is to kind of come up with controls that keep you in a small neighborhood of your uh, operating point, and then you can switch your operating point and do successive linearization based on where you are in the state space. Um, in order to get our essentially to go from xk plus one is equal to let's say some g of xu to our LTI system, which is xk plus one is equal to some axk plus buk. What we're going to use is Taylor approximation. Um, and again, this is something you might have studied in some other classes, so I won't spend too much time on that. But essentially, it's these kind of Jacobians that you'll be computing which is the partial derivative of each element of G or F with respect to each element of the state or the input. And that's going to give you the A and B matrices. So essentially you can get linearization of your system by taking your ODE, applying your first order Taylor approximation to it as shown over here, ignoring your higher order terms, keeping to the first order ones. And then you can convert that to, um, of course the second step over here would be, you would get an X dot as, um, ACX plus BCX. The next step, uh, the next step would then be discretize it using either zero order hold or preferably using exact linearization because you're going from linear system to linear system. And then what you have is an LTI system that you can throw to um, most MPC solvers to work with. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers everything about your system dynamics that you should care about. And the reason why we use linear systems is that they're well understood. We have well-known notions of is the system controllable, are the states observable, that is, can you estimate the full state given a measurement, or can you move your state to wherever you want it, which is controllability. Uh, and in the context of MPC, linear systems give you dynamics and constraints that you can kind of efficiently formulate, again, the linear constraints. So it's going to make your life a lot easier when you use MPC. An example is, uh, let's say, non-holonomic car kinematics as shown over here with three states. Again, we'll get too much into that, but given a reference trajectory, you could linearize it um, by computing the right Jacobians for the A and the B matrix, and you'll end up with a linear time invariant system once you discretize this in time. So anyway, um, these are kind of things you'll do on the inside when you start to implement MPC. Um, but yeah, long story short, these are um, kind of things you, uh, linear models are what you're going to use. So to summarize, MPC is an optimization that's working in the loop with your dynamical system. You're going to apl apply it in a receding horizon manner, which is kind of this whole thing. So that's how you turn your open loop optimization into closed loop control. And MPC gives you a bunch of advantages. That is, it allows you to handle constraints very naturally, especially if they're linear. It gives you controllers that also have optimality guarantees. You'll have, of course, challenges on implementation, like how fast can you use this? Someone raised the question uh, in class, and that was a good question. You'll kind of run into some implementation issues. Guarantees on stability, robustness, feasibility. Those are usually hard to get from MPC unless you do some special tricks, which again, are way beyond the scope of this particular course, but there are methods that allow you to do that as well. So yeah, that's but that. I think that'll, oops, summarize MPC. And let me give you one last, um, Thing to talk about over here, which is MPC is not just for autonomous racing. Uh, it has applications all over whatever you can imagine, from computer control, where you need to have update rates in the order of nanoseconds, to power systems, where you're trying to do voltage or frequency control with microseconds, or even for things like train scheduling, production planning, or you know, smart control of buildings, where your update rates could be of the order of hours, days, or even weeks. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll end the lecture. and. Let's take any questions if you have, if there's time remaining, Rahul. Sure, any questions? Yeah, I think that, that was a lot of material. Yash yeah. basically passed the MPC course and some of the linear systems course on this <laughs> one. Actor. So, but I think this gives yeah. you a good start, right? You, you, you basically have a mental framework of how to get started. You will we'll review the MPCC paper and then get into the details. And we'll also give you a, a skeleton framework. You're not starting from scratch. We don't expect you to have taken the MPC course to solve this, right? So we will help you along the way. But but thanks so much, Yash. I think this was, Thank you, this was really great. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, treat this as more of a high-level introduction to what all could have happened. For the details, you have to take deeper dives 
on your own, I suspect. So yeah, I think the reference for the MPCC paper is going to be useful. But also, Rahul, if you want, I can send some references on linear systems. But I think that probably won't be required for the class. If you, especially if you tell what the system dynamics are going to be. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. Um, Thank you. Stop sharing then. Great. Thanks, Rahul. Thanks, everyone.